The president last out on you on Twitter Thursday after your announcement that you're leaving the Republican Party, saying, quote, great news for the Republican Party is one of the dumbest and most disloyal men in Congress is, quote, quitting the party, no collusion, no obstruction, knew he couldn't get the nomination to run again in the great state of Michigan, already being challenged for a seat, a total loser. I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond. I mean, I don't have a response to it. It's, it's what the president does. It's what he says. Um, and I think most people understand that's not how people are supposed to talk uh, about each other and to each other. And uh, I think he's really identified what I talked about in my op-ed, which is um, he thinks that people owe loyalty to him. But people are, people are elected to Congress uh, with an oath to support and defend the Constitution, not an oath to support and defend one person, the president uh, who happens to be from your own party. Do you think that kind of attack, personal, personal, nasty, name-calling, um, do you think fearing that kind of attack is why more of your Republican colleagues don't speak out when they see things they don't like from the president? Yeah, it's a big part of it. Uh, they're afraid they'll be attacked. They're afraid that people uh, back home who are uh, listening to certain uh, forms of media will say, well, uh, the president's right, this guy is a terrible person and we need to go after him. So. It's a combination of things. Uh, I don't think a lot of the partisan discord and the rest started with President Trump. It's been going on for years, and it's gotten worse in recent years. But he's helping to fuel it, and he's making it worse, and he's making it more difficult for people to be independent in Congress. You stand to lose some political power by leaving the Republican Party. The vice chair of the Republican Con Conference, Congressman Mar Mark Walker, uh, tweeted, quote, Amash left the Freedom Caucus, now he's leaving the GOP. The House GOP never left Justin Amash. We simply ran out of space for his ego. However, we should make sure he leaves the Republican conference and his committee. What would you say to a, a supporter or a constituent who says, by leaving the party, you are uh, hurting your congressional district because you no longer are going to have, potentially, I mean, do, do you anticipate you're going to be kicked off the Oversight Committee? Uh, I anticipate that I may be kicked off. Um and, uh, and that's okay, I understand the consequences of doing what I'm doing. Uh, at the end of the day though, I've done this for several years. I've worked within the Republican Party. I've tried to make changes from within. My colleagues have tried to make changes from within. It hasn't worked. It's not working for anyone. I'm not the only one trying. I have colleagues who are trying every day and who are frustrated, but they are not speaking out the same way. Um, I hope they will speak out. But it's time to try something different. It's time to be a, a committed, independent representative for my district so that everyone back home knows where I stand. Because right now, when you go back home, you hear uh, Republicans who don't trust you because you're not aligned with the president. You hear Democrats who don't trust you because you're a Republican. And most of the people in my district do trust me. They, they respect me. They support me. And I want those people to know that I'm there for them. I'm there to represent every single person in the community. But not having any power on a committee doesn't that hurt your ability to serve your constituents? In today's politics, the committees have almost no power. And I want people at home to understand that. Everything is really run top down. When I say that, I mean it very literally. The Speaker of the House very much controls the entire process. The Speaker decides what comes out of committee. When Speaker Ryan, our Republican Speaker, was there, the, I was on uh, several committees, and nothing ever came out of the committees that w wasn't approved by Speaker Ryan. So let me ask you about that, because um, I talked to Brendan Buck, who was a senior advisor to both Speaker Paul Ryan and to Speaker Boehner, um, and he says one of the reasons why Congress isn't functioning as it should is because of the Freedom Caucus. That's the perspective of a lot of people in Republican leadership, as I'm sure you know. Specifically, Buck said, you can't have an honest conversation about partisanship and polarization in the last five years without acknowledging the role the Freedom Caucus played. They insisted on loyalty to their own tribe above all else and drove this toxic notion that compromise is treason. As you mentioned, you're a founding member of the Freedom Caucus. What's your response to that? Do you, do you think that the Freedom Caucus deserves any blame for how things are, are going in Congress right now? So I don't want to speak for the Freedom Caucus today since I'm no longer a member, but I will say when the Freedom Caucus was founded, the purpose was to open up the process. And uh, the Speaker of the House and his spokespeople have it totally backward. They were closing down the entire system, and members of the Freedom Caucus said, well, we need to band together to ensure that we open this up. We want to be able to offer amendments on the House floor. Uh, under Speaker Ryan, for example, for the first time in congressional history, we had a whole Congress where not a single member of Congress was able to go to the House floor and offer an amendment. 
It was the first time in history. It was the most closed Congress in history. And now under Speaker Pelosi, we have the same problem, where we're not allowed to go to the House floor and offer amendments. So the thing is closed down. We need to open it up. And sometimes you have to form a group like the Freedom Caucus to stand up to the establishment in Washington. So just to give their perspective, for instance, um, the Senate passed immigration reform during uh, the Obama years. It was a bipartisan bill, uh, passed with 60-something votes, mostly Democrats, but some Republicans as well. Speaker Boehner wouldn't even bring it up. And they say it's because the House Freedom Caucus would insist on you can't bring up any legislation unless you know that a majority of Republicans are going to support it. And for that reason, uh, there, there wasn't a free and open process. And well, that was never the philosophy of the Freedom Caucus. The Freedom Caucus was about opening up the process. I can't speak for individual members who may have felt that way. Um, but the, speaker, the um, Freedom Caucus was about opening up the process and ensuring that the speaker allowed us to offer amendments, allowed us to offer suggestions, because it's supposed to be a deliberative body. We're not just supposed to take things and pass them. We're supposed to debate and, and represent the American people. You've said that people turn to, into, quote, zombies when they come to Washington because they're telling you things privately that are different than what they say publicly. What are you hearing from fellow Republicans privately? Obviously, you don't have to mention their names about your decision uh, and about being a Republican member of Congress in the Trump era. Well, I get, uh, you know, people sending me text messages, people calling me saying, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, great op ed. Uh, when I was discussing impeachment, I had fellow colleagues and, and other Republicans, high-level officials, contacting me saying, thank you for what you're doing. So there are lots of Republicans out there who are saying these things privately, but they're not saying it publicly. And I think that's a problem for our, for our country. It's a problem for the Republican Party. Um, it's a problem for the Democratic Party when people aren't allowed to speak out. So I, I think we really need the American people to stand up and say, hey, enough is enough. We've had it with these two parties trying to ram their partisan nonsense down our throats week after week. We want a person to go represent us and be uh, open and represent the entire community. Are you running for re-election as an independent in, to Congress? Yes, I am. Yes. You are, and you think you can win as an independent? Yes, I'm very confident about that. What about the possibility of your running for president uh, as a libertarian or some under, uh, some, under some other uh, ticket um, I asked you about that uh, four or five months ago, and you didn't rule it out. Is it possible you would run for president? I still wouldn't rule anything like that out. Um, I believe that I have to use my skills, my uh, public influence, where it uh, serves the country best. And I believe I have to defend the Constitution in, which, in whichever way works best. And if that means doing something else, then I do that. But uh, I feel uh, confident about running in my district. I feel a close tie to my community. I feel I care a lot about my community. I want to represent them in Congress. When do you think you'll make a decision about a possible presidential run? Well, it's, it's something people talk about all the time. Uh, it's not something that's right on my radar right now, so I, I couldn't tell you. What do you think about, when, what, what does it feel like when you have, first of all, when you, you, I think you made your announcement about um, impeachment, and Donald Trump Jr. on Twitter basically threatened that he was going to support whoever primaried you. Uh, then you announce that you're not running as a Republican. President Trump issues the tweet that he issues. This is the most powerful family in the country right now, and they're gunning for you. What does that feel like just as a person? Well, it doesn't scare me. Um, I feel confident in what I do. I have people back home who support me. I have people back home who care about me. Uh, when I go back to my district, people are uh, coming up to me and saying, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, people want open, honest representation. They want people to come to Congress and work with integrity. And uh, what the president is doing is actually lowering the tone across the country. He's uh, harming civil discourse. He's creating a lot of uh, partisan divide. He's enhancing it. Um, and uh, I think that's very dangerous for our country. And I don't think a lot of people appreciate it. I think a lot of people put up with it because the economy is good right now. But um, I don't think they'd put up with it if things went uh, south. So you've come out in support of impeaching, or at least beginning the proceedings of impeaching President Trump. You've said there's no point uh, in formally bringing articles of impeachment right now because Speaker Pelosi doesn't support it. Is she making a mistake? Do you think that the Democrats should be starting impeachment proceedings based on the Mueller report, what's in there about uh, potential obstruction of justice, which is the case you laid out? Yeah, from a principled, moral position, she is making a mistake. Uh, from a strategic position, she's making a mistake. If she believes, as I do, that there's impeachable conduct in there, then she should say so. She should tell the American people we're going to move forward with impeachment hearings and, and uh, potentially articles of impeachment. 
When she says things like, oh, I think that we need to have the strongest case before we go forward, what she's telling the American people is she doesn't think there's a strong case. If she doesn't think that, then she shouldn't open her mouth in the first place and say she thinks there's impeachable conduct. I do believe there's a strong case. I believe she believes there's a strong case. And if so, she should move forward and make sure that the American people understand what's going on. Because people at home aren't reading the Mueller report. Most people don't have time to read a 448-page report. Ex they expect their members of Congress to do the work for them. They want Speaker Pelosi to do the work. They want other members to do the work. And if she doesn't want to go forward, then we're going to have a big problem. Last question. How many of your Republican colleagues do you think have actually read the Mueller report? I think it's probably less than 15%. And I'd say that's uh, probably the case on both sides of the aisle.